Times are uncertain, but your job doesn't have to be. Fidelity Investments is hiring for tech roles in Ireland. Apply now at fidelityinvestments.ie. Hello and you're welcome to The Big Tech Show with me, Adrian Wexler, the tech editor of the Irish and Sunny Independent. And this week is all about security. I'm joined by Brian Honan, who's the owner of BH Consulting, one of the better known, maybe the best known, one of the better known um, security consultancies uh, in Ireland. Brian, you're welcome to the podcast. Um, great, to have, great to be here, Adrian. Thanks for having me. Uh, I like the way when you bob your head in and out like that, we're kind of have a Tron thing going on. <laughs> Stroke Max, Max Headroom. You remember Max you're Headroom? Sh- you're showing your age now, Adrian. You're saying that we love all the uh, millennials going about, for Max Headroom and one, Tron and stuff. <laughs> once every while, I actually Google Max Headroom to see if the guy is still alive. I think he is. Um, wow. yeah. I was obsessed with yeah. that in the 1980s. Anyway, yeah, that does show my age. Good, good old MTV. <laughs> good old MTV, yeah. So we're going to talk when, today. When, when MTV played music videos. <laughs> we were only talking about that the other day, and I have a whole anecdote ready to go on that, but I'm not going to go into it for it <laughs> now. We're going to talk today about security. We're going to talk about some of the um, more important mm-hmm. things, things that you're generally across, like uh, uh, cybercrime, ransomware, CEO fraud, things like that. Yeah. I'm going to start just with a thing that I have come across a little bit more in the last few weeks and months. It's called celeb bait. It's a thing where listeners and viewers might remember yeah. Miriam McCallaghan uh, has taken a case uh, uh, regarding someone who was trying to pass off her image um, with fakes. I think it was tanning cream or with some sort of skin cream alleging that she had left her job in RT. Absolutely outrageous. She mm. took a, cor- uh, a case um, she tried to get Facebook to hand over the details. So that's an ongoing case. Uh, she's making quite a bit of headway there. The uh, a number of defendants um, have been named in that, a, a lot of them from Eastern Europe. Um, but I'm kind of slightly fascinated by it because I've run into it uh, myself. I haven't been the victim of a celeb. I'm not a celeb, <laughs> I should hasten to say. But there was one ad I came across the other day, actually, yeah. um, and it was from, you know, on some sites have these sponsored ads, Outbrain or whatever, and one of them was for um, allegedly a Bitcoin or a cyber currency mm-hmm. trading platform involving, supposedly, it had the image of John Collison, Stripes John Collison, oh, and, wow. T- and TV3's Karen Custer, and apparently the two of them <laughs> We're doing yeah. an interview. I mean, they I, I they, they just ripped off the image of John Collison from an early web summit uh, yeah. uh, appearance that he made. And then they took uh, a still of Karen Coster on the couch on Ireland mm-hmm. AM. And they kind of tried to infer that there was a conversation between them as to how John Collison had gotten so rich so quickly. And apparently yeah. the answer was he invested in a virtual currency. But of course. Um, yeah. <laughs> So completely ridiculous. Um, yeah. And I flagged it as well. Um, and just in case there are any lawyers listening to this, no, we are not saying any of this is true. We're literally highlighting <laughs> this to show how absurd it is. Yes. But it's it's quite interesting, isn't it? I mean, um, it's it's getting quite common now as well. I see quite a lot of this stuff, friend. Have you ever seen yeah, any of this stuff? Oh, absolutely. It's rampant, actually. Uh, I think about this time last year, Ray Darcy show contacted me because his image had been used on similar ads on Facebook to promote. He left RTE to because he made so so much money on this cryptocurrency scheme as well. And uh, it's just these criminals will use whatever me- means they can to try and convince people and uh, lure people into their schemes. And youth and celebrities are well-known people's images uh is one way to try and legitimize what they're trying to do. So you see uh, something being advertised, be that tanning lotion, as in the case of Miriam McCallan, or cryptocurrencies, uh, or whatever it may be, having somebody you know and trust and targeting those ads based on the where the, where the people are going to be located. So for example, you know, Miriam McCann obviously was being targeted at Irish uh, people because if, if you, that advert was on, any social media platform based in France or Germany, it's, it's not going to have an impact. But they would use German celebrities or French celebrities for those audiences. So they're just luring people in. And that's what criminals are very, very good at. They're very good at uh, engineering and making us react emotionally 
to something that we see, be that uh, an advert on uh, a website we visit, be that an email we get or a text message we get. They're very good at knowing what buttons to push. So we will do what they want us to do. Yeah, I, I mean, I was being a bit facetious earlier on when I was talking about the level of celebrity you have to have, but I had quite a an interesting and at times slightly delicate radio chat recently with Jennifer Zamparelli, who's at 2FM, has her own mm-hmm. 2FM show. We were talking about this and she was a victim of this as well. In her case, somebody was trying to advertise diet pills uh, on yeah. Facebook. And by the way, Facebook are well aware of all of this. I mean, mm-hmm. I ended up getting a statement from Facebook. They're well aware of this celeb bait issue. They, they take action. on. But the chat I had with Jennifer was around, at one point, the question came up, well, who are they targeting? Now, the answer is exactly as you framed it. Somebody who's well-known and famous and has an emotional trigger with somebody, uh, with a a, a group of people. And yet even within that, there are different tiers of celebrity. Like I was, I I started down the road of conversation and then had to sort of be very politic about it as to comparing the level of celebrity of Jennifer Zamparelli and Miriam O'Callaghan. I had started the sentence. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I realized, uh oh, <laughs> I might be getting into yeah. a bit of an issue here. So the way I framed it at the time was that it was the, the, the person they picked was designed to hit a particular type of audience, maybe a demographic absolutely. audience, a time yeah. of life audience. Okay. Yeah. No, um, absolutely. Like I know, if I, was, if I wanted to target you, Adrian, for example, I, I would send an ad to your Facebook page uh, saying the Jurgen Club is promoting some uh, <laughs> fantastic uh, uh, free uh, we cryptocurrency see, or whatever. You know, well, and you see, if, that, if you that would if have you an emotional connection to a certain, it, it would. Thing. Although, if you were alleging that Jurgen Club was promoting a, a tooth whitening cream, <laughs> I, I'd, I'd probably sort of believe it. I wouldn't even Our think razors. it was fake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or razors, you know, or or Roberto Firmino, the same thing. I yeah. mean, I think Roberto Firmino uh, has, I think, isn't there a new level of whiteness for his teeth that they invented? <laughs> is, it, is it beyond 10? I don't yeah. know. We're, we're, we're going to get down Liverpool rabbit hole. We're not going to go there. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, there's actually quite a few Irish um, celebrities, well-known people yeah. who are, who have been a victim of this. And most of them just ignore it because like, what do you do? Like, do you... Do you contact Facebook? I mean, do you go to a solicitor and start paying a solicitor to pursue it? I mean, your chances of getting anything out of it are probably pretty slim. I think in Mary McCallaghan's case, she's the reason she went after it was because they were saying she had left RT and it was quite a wide Facebook mm-hmm. thing that was being shared and people were saying, oh my gosh, I didn't know this was true. Yeah. So she just decided to take a stand uh, on yeah. it. Um but for the mirror, for the Brian Honans or the Adrian Wecklers, if we're ever targeted, like you just sort of chuckle, wouldn't you? Yeah. But see, it also highlights how much personal data we're putting online. Mm. Uh, so you're getting the ads you get into your uh, social media feed or Facebook feed or whatever is all based on the likes and the clicks you've done and who you can connected with so absolutely the criminals will know this person is a certain age bracket is interested in this sort of topic uh, listens to this radio station so the, the they probably have a bank of celebrities that they will slot into those particular ad campaigns aimed at that demographic so it's important that you know even if you want to take this out to to a big level like the victims in all this aren't really the celebrities okay there's some reputational damage and brand damage for them there but it's actually the innocent people who who fall victim to these scams uh, who will mm-hmm. hand over money for stuff that doesn't work or something they're, 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 they'll never see again so they are the victims and the way to try and protect yourself better from these scams is do as you did Adrian is when you see one report it so that helps Facebook deal with them uh, but also make sure you review your privacy settings in all these social media platforms that and, and only share minimal stuff be, be very wary of, of what you're sharing online because you know we have seen uh, I don't know them if, if people want to look watch the movie hacked on netflix it's, it does show you the power of, of your personal data being used by social media platforms being sold to third parties and how they misuse and abuse the information for their own means and how yeah, they the, target you for what you want 
Now, on the, I know the social networks always step in at this point and say, when it comes to the literal sentence, selling data to others, they say they don't sell your personal data to yeah. third party companies. But what they do is they essentially um, leverage your personal data, give access yeah. to the, the most important bits of your personal data yeah. in exchange for you know, monetary uh, consideration somewhere down the line. So it's, it's not that different a distinction. One of the interesting things about this uh, thing as well, when I went looking into it before, was how organized it is in terms of um, sort of a lot of smaller companies who literally set up to try and take advantage of this, this kind of thing. Mm. Sometimes, I'm not sure if any listeners have ever been asked uh, to rent their Facebook profile out. Apparently, I've never been asked that, but apparently it's a thing. And there are companies there that will ask you to do that. And then they themselves will re-rent that out to third parties. And that's mm -hmm. sometimes where um, where the scammers come in. Um, on another point, um, yeah. one thing that you've been looking at recently, and we may have spoken about this before, is the issue of CEO fraud or email yes. redirection fraud. Yeah. Just explain very briefly what that is. Well, CEO fraud and invoice redirection fraud are both from the same family. And in effect, even though we're talking about cybersecurity here today, it is just plain old fraud because uh, I always remember talking to my father and he asked me, Brian, what is it that you really do? And I tried to explain to him about <sighs> penetration testing and hacking and all this sort of stuff. And I was losing them. And then I said, Dad, look, what sometimes happens is people send emails to other people pretending that they've got money to give them. And, uh, you know, they just need access to your bank account to do that. And my father laughed and said, oh, are they still doing that? Because back in the 70s, in his office, you used to get telexes and fax and letters on the same thing. So the scam, these scams are around a long time. They're just better facilitated by uh, computer networks and, and emails. So CEO fraud, in effect, is where criminals will uh, do a bit of research about a company so they'll check your uh, your company on linkedin see who the main uh, people are on linkedin you know the senior management who your ceo is they will then create a spoof email uh, so, uh, so you know my, my company email is bhconsulting.ie so maybe instead of bhconsulting.ie they have bhconsulting dot IN or, or, dot IN yeah. or something else that, that looks different. So, but to somebody who is busy and they get an email in, they go, that's from Brian Honan and Brian's the CEO and he's now telling me, I'm bringing up very much the, the email is crafted urgently, you know, it's from your CEO. Uh, I have this urgent deal to do or the invoice that, that needs to be paid today is for 10,000 euro or 40,000 euro. It's a secret deal. We need to be done quickly, and I'm jumping into a conference call, or I'm only available for the next six hours. Please make sure this money mm -hmm. is paid to this bank account by the end of the day. And the person receiving that sees the email and think it's from, does think it's from the CEO, mm -hmm. and will then, you know, process that payment without any further check. So, in the that's fact, where not, that, that's where the the problem often is, isn't it? Where that's where the just problem is. Yeah, there's no verification. There's no, uh, no it process aren't followed properly to make sure. Look, is this payment legitimate? Is it coming from the right email address? Is this really from Brian or from Adrian or somebody pretending to be? Do you, know, do you know the thing about fake emails, though? Yeah. I looked into this once. It's really easy to spoof Absolutely. an email. Like, yes. I mean, really, like some listeners now may have come across prank email or texting services. Yeah. Um, remember, there used to be a few, a spoof box was one, an mailer was another. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, these are, these are browser services. You just go on the browser. You can, in a few clicks, uh, give them the email address that you want to appear yeah. in the from line and, and, and get them to, to, to send it off. I remember trying it out, um, pretending to be Leo Varadkar, sending myself an email. <laughs> yeah. And it worked fine. Now, once you interrogate the email yes. uh, address a bit further, you, you'll see, but how many people actually do that? But it's so easy to do. And, and not just um, emails, but also text mm -hmm. messages as well. Yeah. Um, and, and, and phone calls. 
Uh, absolutely. And then this is what criminals are relying on. See, what we tend to forget is the internet was never created to be secure. The internet was designed and created to share information as easily and as freely as possible. So a lot, a lot of the native protocols, if you like, the foundation that we rely on, uh, TCP IP, uh, the email protocols, were designed to be easy to implement and to share stuff. Security wasn't really a concern and neither was privacy. So now we're trying to uh, rebuild and put security on top of these insecure protocols, which which is the problem. Uh, there are certain tools that companies can use to try and ensure they have the right security. So firstly, companies can put in uh, proper filters on their incoming emails, like spam filters and phishing e filters to try and block the, the obvious uh, spoofy e emails. You can also use email protocols like DMARC, D-M-A-R-C, uh, DKIM, DKIM, and SPF. Uh, those three protocols are all additional configurations you put on your email server, or you, you ask your email, you, you work with your email provider to put onto your company's email uh, accounts, and they add a, a extra levels of authentic. Mm -hmm. onto your email so that if somebody tries to spoof your your company email address or pretend to be you that the receiving person uh email server go now hang on this is not a legitimate email and you know it. now it's not it's not 100 but it does no. raise the bar a bit, bit more and on the d mark the first one you mentioned there i remember okay. checking a few months ago i wrote a thing about this and i went and looked up a lot of the big organizations in ireland mm -hmm. a couple of banks posing public sector organizations yeah. only one or two had actually um implemented that stuff yeah. some quite a few hadn't yeah and perhaps see, part of the problem is adrian is that we've we've used a lot of these add-on tools at corporate levels uh to enable uh integration of systems with email. So you might be using a CRM system that's hosted by another company to send emails out on behalf of you. So mm. that email, you know, technically that email is coming from a, a different company, but it's pretending to be coming from your company. Uh, so trying right, to see what you mean. Up. Yeah. So you have all these systems that are trying to integrate and pretend to be coming from your company's email account. It can take time and it can break certain processes. So mm. this is the challenge that we face actually from a security point of view. And a lot of things is, as I said, the foundations that we built our, our online house on are fundamentally not secure. So we're trying to fix the foundations, but not bring mm. the building down at the same time. And just on the email fraud and uh, yeah. CEO fraud, email re redirection fraud, I mean, there have been a few cases over the years, a few that I wrote about before. There was mm -hmm. one involving Trinity College that was hit yeah. for 2017. I think it was 800,000 euro. And if I – actually, I can't remember the particulars of that case. I think it was to do with um, – it may have been a graduate – Serves anyway. I, I can't actually remember the particulars. Like it was eight hundred thousand euro. Dublin Zoo uh, got hit then in mm -hmm. around the same time for half a million as well. But the the basics of it were the same. Somebody uh, got in in between the email process, pretended they were somebody else from a supplier's yeah. point of view, pretended to be the supplier. They yeah. weren't, and yes. uh, before they knew what was happening, um, they had uh, they had paid. You know, hundreds of thousands of euros, the bad guys. I think in some case, those cases, they got some of that money back. Um, but I, I know talking to guys like uh, Pat Lorden, superintendent in mm -hmm. the guards, his basic rule of thumb is unless you sniff it out in a few days, your yeah, chances of getting it back are slim. Yeah. So those. So we talked about the CEO fraud where somebody sends an email pretending to the CEO saying, pay this bill immediately. The other one, the invoice redirection fraud is where I as a criminal try and pretend to be a, uh, a vendor. So for example, I'd, I would figure out, look at see who's a vendor for the uh, Irish Independent, for example. And then mm. I'll try, I'll pretend to be that vendor. I would spoof an email saying, look, uh, our banking details have changed. So any future payments, please send to this bank account. Uh, they might, that could happen in, in various ways. They could, uh, they could, uh, 
hijack or compromise an email account belonging to the vendor so they get a copy of the genuine invoice and then they make a change mm. say you know, pay to this bank account uh, the normal so the vendor doesn't know when things happened because the e as far as they're concerned the emails are, are going okay the customer has just been instructed by the vendor or at least i think they have to send future payments to, to, to this account so it can actually take a few months for victims to realize they've been paying money not to the vendor as they had thought they would be but actually to uh, uh to, to criminals and as you said the sooner you, you you catch on there's the more chance you have of, of getting your money but if it's been going on for a few weeks and you've been paying a few invoices this way you, i'm afraid there's very little chance you're going to get your money back because the criminals once they get the money transfer to other bank accounts and, and siphon it off very 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 quickly yeah yeah um before we move on to one or two of the other things there's another one floating around it's it's a an email sextortion scam yeah. where basically you get an email which says essentially we know what you've been looking at yeah. and uh if you don't want us to share it more widely and by the way this is your password yes. and if that happens to be your password you get completely freaked out think you've been hacked and then mm -hmm. maybe you'll <clears throat> you'll pay over a bitcoin but in fact they haven't really hacked your password themselves have they that's correct yeah so the way that scam works is that uh somewhere along the way uh and it's happened to all of us the websites we sign up to and we, we uh, create a password for are often, uh, something can often be, be hacked. And if they're hacked, the criminals then are able to access, maybe, depending on how that company protects your password, but the criminals might be able to get access to your password, to the password you use for that website. Mm. And these would be traded so, on databases. Like if you, if, you, on, if, if, you yeah. visit, if you visit the site, um, have I been pawned, P-W-N-E-D, yeah, yeah. Uh, dot com and you put in your email address yeah um the chances are that w at some point in one of these massive data breaches you know yahoo three billion email addresses yeah uh, diff different uh, services um, and yeah. that it might have been included in that a and then also if you haven't changed your your password in three years yeah exactly and have i been pawned actually i was going to mention myself adrian so i'm glad you did it's a it's a legit website it's a legit service it's by an australian uh, uh, security researcher called troy hunt and he takes in the data from all the breach websites and you can put your email address in and it'll come back and say these are all the websites that have been hacked that your password has been compromised so on the criminal underground uh criminals who hack into websites are selling our data left, right, and center. They're selling our data for money, uh, and part of that is your passwords. So the risk we run is that uh, if you use the same password across many different uh, websites, well, obviously, the criminals get your password to one website. They can try for everything else. So if, if your Yahoo email account has been compromised, and you use that same password for your Amazon account, your eBay, your Facebook, your social media, your banking or whatever, mm. the criminals will go and try and access those systems and uh, steal money or, or, or whatever from you. But this particular scam is that's exactly what's happened. They've come across a password belonging to you in one of those password dumps somewhere. They've sent you this email saying, look, we've uh, malware installed on your computer. We've activated your webcam. We can see you've been watching pornography. If, you don't pay this, this this money we're going to release uh, the video view out on the internet to all your friends uh, mm. and it comes back to the point i made earlier on criminals use things to social engineer us to push our buttons to react having your password that you know is one of your passwords in that email makes you think oh my god this is legitimate uh if I said, no, you've been watching pornography and not, you go, oh my God, this is legitimate. My password is there. Uh, yeah, I mean, it must I, be I true. It must be true. Um, Absolutely. Uh, do you, are you a believer in password managers like LastPass Absol or anything? Yes. Any? yes. Yeah. So I, 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 I would not survive without LastPass. I'm, I go against it. There is the old thing in, uh, in cybersecurity, never write your passwords down. Uh, but then we also say to you, Adrian, your password must be uppercase, lowercase, uh, alphanumeric with special characters, more than eight letters long. You should change it every 30 days or so. Uh, make it something that's easy to remember but hard to guess. Like, that's ridiculous. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's strange. You know, nobody can do that. What I recommend is uh, uh, use a passphrase. Adrian's podcast mm-hmm. is the best tech podcast. That is a much mm-hmm. more secure password than an eight character, uppercase, lowercase, uh, special character one. And it's a phrase you can easily remember. And have one for every different website you use. Now, if you use lots of websites or lots of systems, that's going to be a lot of passwords to try and remember. So having a password safe, which is a piece of software that's either hosted on your computer or hosted in the cloud, allows you to store your passwords in a secure place that you can say, okay, if I'm going to access my bank account, here's my password for that. If I'm going to access my social media, here's my password for that. And they are very powerful. I, I use them all the time. Yeah, actually, I am starting to rely a little bit more on iOS password uh, manager uh, suggestions. So, uh, if you're using an iPhone, mm-hmm. um, it will off it will often uh, recognize the site that you're on, recognize if you agreed to it before to say yeah. that you saved your password. Use your Face ID or whatever it is, your Touch yeah. ID, uh, and then we'll let you in uh, that way. Not in, not completely differently to if you were using Revolut, for example, in a shop. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I am starting to find that that is kind of convenient. Now I chop and change between devices a lot, so it's, mm. I'm not just using iOS. I'm using Android and Windows quite a lot as well. But yeah, I, I, I've I've wondered about I've I've resisted signing up wholesale to Last Password or One Password. Is it? There's a there are a few of them. It's one Password, Last Pass, Key mm. Pass. There's quite a few, and they're all they're they're all good. Uh, mm. Uh, mm. Very good. But I think what we're seeing, Adrian, is that. Uh, Passwords are a cheap way for companies to implement security or what they think is security onto their, their user base. Uh, we do need to move away from passwords. And you mentioned face ID and biometrics. And, you know, 10, 15 years ago, if you said to people, in order to access your device, you're going to have to give it your, your fingerprint or your, your facial uh, features for facial recognition, people would be up in arms. But mm-hmm. the great thing that... Apple they still are. They still are, but the difference as this time around is that uh, uh, these security features are implemented transparently and easily for people to use. I say mm-hmm. with encryption, 10, 15 years ago, to put encryption on a laptop or a mobile phone, you're, you're buying a third-party piece of software. You needed to be have some tech savvy to install it. If anything went wrong, you were screwed. Uh, but now it's built into the devices we buy, the laptops or the the tablets or the, the phones we have, it's built in automatically. So these things have become transparent. Uh, we make our devices much more secure transparently and, and the user experience is easier. Passwords mm. is where, where we're, we're still failing though. So what I'd recommend is that where it's available, put in multi-factor authentication. So for a lot of the social media uh, platforms, as well as using your password, you also have have the option to say, look, if, if I log in from a, a device I haven't logged in from before, send me a message either by text or with a, an app on my phone that I have an, another code that I have to put in. So if I wanted to log into your Facebook, Adrian, if I just got your password, I could log on from any device and log into Facebook or to uh, your email or whatever. Mm. But you've turned on multi-factor authentication. Suddenly now I need to have access to your phone or the device that you have there. And, and these, there is progress happening there to make our online experience password less, but at the same time making it yeah, as, I mean, if not more secure. There is a speed and convenience issue there as well. I really yeah. don't want to be waiting for a text message to reply to it or to get a further password. I, I, I think maybe coming back to the facial recognition mm-hmm. and um, uh, that I think Apple is an interesting case study here because when iPhones or iPads introduce something, there's much lower friction in accepting yep. the adoption than there is for other services. Now, Apple would season that and go, oh, that's because we're way more privacy focused <laughs> and people trust us and all. Um, there might be an element uh, of that. But if you compare, for example, uh, face facial recognition on smartphones, particularly on iPhones, compared to voice recognition with yep. Amazon and Google, people are way more suspicious about voice recognition because of the business models of the companies mm. that develop yeah. them mainly. Yeah. I mean, a- Apple's Apple's voice recognition. Sorry, Apple. It's just, it's not that good. It's 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 not <laughs> as good as Google's or particularly Amazon's. 
Yeah. Um, but there's a reason for that. It's because they don't push the edges as much as Google uh, and Amazon uh, and, and even Microsoft, you, you might argue. Yeah. Um, but there, it's kind of fascinating to me how people are up in arms about, you know, well, my face, you know, is not a piece of information that should be true. And then they will absolutely log in on their on Face ID yeah. on their iPhone, but because because they trust the company, I think. I think. Well, see, this is what you know. It comes to two things: it's it's trust, but it's also also usability as well. It's it's, it's quite easy to use. But I think you know, if you look at some of the companies you just mentioned there, like the the Android and Amazon. Well, like in effect, you're giving your information, your voice information to Google for Android, which, you know, you're giving information to an advertising company uh, who will look, look at it that way. Uh, you also, Amazon is a company that wants to sell you stuff. And the more they know about you, the more they can profile you to, to sell you what they think you need. So there is that certain absolutely, you know, how much do I trust these companies with this information? Because what are they going to use it for? And and despite the reassurances that they give us, we, you know, there, there have been breaches and there have been cases where we've seen uh, th- that 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 breach of trust has been, you know, that, mm. that trust has been breached uh, in a, in a few cases. And like, there's a famous one in the U.S. where uh, I think the police went to Amazon to, to try and get the recordings from a, a, an Amazon Echo device in a house where a murder occurred uh, to see what then captured on the voice recognition software there. And when you hear stories like that, you, you realize like this information is not staying on, on your device. So the when you get your facial ID and your thumbprint stays on the Apple devices, it, it's not sent to Apple. Whereas your voice information on Amazon, et cetera, is sent to those companies because it's sent to the cloud so they can process it and then determine what it is you're trying to say. Uh, and some of that processing is done uh, is, is done by human beings to, to make sure that they're, they analy- they're analyzing the data properly. So well, that, that I suspect. mean, it's a funny because that brings up, the issue of the call that we're on at the moment. We're on we're on a Zoom call yeah. at the moment, and <laughs> Zoom had its results earlier this week, and mm-hmm. they did spectacularly well, as we all knew that they would. But one of the main talking points out of it actually was the CEO Eric Guan, who said that they wouldn't be completely encrypting the calls end to end, partly to leave open the possibility of working with law enforcement now. Yeah. Alex Stamos, who I've interviewed before, former Yahoo and Facebook security guy, very well respected, essentially working as a consultant now to Zoom, was on Twitter during the week. And he was he was kind of Jesuitically going through the reasons why they might have to consider it. And to be fair to he's a guy that I do respect. Um, and he was trying to balance the uh, what society wants from Zoom. But at the same time, it was taken up and it was reported as mm. such that if you use Zoom now, there is a very, 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 very small chance that at some point, especially if you're recording to the cloud, because one of the, the premium features, if you pay for it mm. a, a month, as I do, if, if, if you record to the cloud, um, is that they may actually retain some data uh, from the calls yeah. and, and cooperate with law enforcement. Yeah, and this is, you know, we have this, challenge at the moment there's this one of a better phrase a conflict uh, and it's not just with zoom it's it's with many technologies about encryption so uh encryption is used to secure our data while it's trans trans tra- traveling across the internet or while it's been stored somewhere on the internet now the whole purpose of encryption is to keep the information secure and to keep it private so that third parties can't listen in uh so great i'm logging into my bank i don't want criminals to be able to intercept my traffic and alter my payments or capture my password or anything else so that they can log on and pretend to be me so encryption protects me when i'm working online but also protects criminals if i if you and i are criminals and we want to plan uh, a crime or we want to uh, exchange uh, illicit material, illegal material, if you do an encryption, the police can't monitor that. 
So you have this ability that criminals can uh, use encryption to hide what they're doing. And it's a challenge for law enforcement mm. to try and do that. And we do have this, uh, we do need to have this open debate, I think. It's, it's, it's been ongoing for quite a while. But oh, we it, do it, have it blows this, up every year. There's always up, an incident. I, I mean, Apple's it, usually at, at the heart of it. Um, yeah. I, I remember doorstepping Drew Harris for something completely different, uh, the mm. guard, the commissioner, a few months ago. And I asked him, look, you know, the Brits and the Americans are constantly at Apple for a back door into their encrypted yeah. uh, encrypted iPhones. What do you think about that? And he was like, yeah, well, that, to be honest, that would be actually very useful to us. And yeah. I, I mean, I would definitely, it would be really, really helpful investigating crime. Now, I reported that and there was quite a, you know, backlash, oh, you know, outrage. And I understand, I, I would probably myself be more on the privacy side than I yeah. would on the law and order side f- on that particular issue. I can see his point in his job as well, though. Yeah, yeah. You know? and, and that's the debate we have to have. Like, you have, uh, you know, when I talk to law enforcement about this, I always say, well, who, who do you trust? Do you trust your law enforcement? They go, absolutely. We're, we're, you know, you can trust us. We're the... Uh, nice police force and saying, well, would you trust the police force from so- such a country or another mm. country? And actually go, at the moment, well, the whole police force, we, 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 <laughs> it is the week that uh, trust in police yeah. forces has arguably taken a little bit of a hit. That's not to talk about the Irish uh, Guardian, no, no. but but right yeah. now it's, it's a challenging time to talk about trust in police forces. Exactly. You know, you, if you want to go out and protest, which is which is your legitimate and legal right to do in a Western democracy, do you want the police to be able to enc- break the encryption on your phone so they can s- listen to where you're going and what you're going to do? I mean, I, 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 I personally, yeah. I don't, right? But yeah. but when you're asked to, to test that belief... I, <laughs> A lot of people who say they don't want that, when it actually comes down to it in certain cases, will actually say that they would yes. be more comfortable if uh, the police had uh, the ability to, or the, or that tech company should hand over information. I'm a little bit closer to the American idea of privacy in that uh, I, I'm probably like you, I actually really believe in encryption, mm. even when, and this is the test, even when it has a bad outcome. Oh, so, yeah. Like, like the, the, the scenario often given to me when I argue for pro- encryption would be your child is being kidnapped and the police have the phone that they can that's have it. for use yeah, that's encrypted. That's it, yeah. do, you, do you believe they should have a back door? I'm like, okay, yeah, give me an extreme argument mm-hmm. to, you know, an example. Yeah. But we do have to have this debate because we, we have two camps. We've got the pro encryption camp who say, no, no, never, never, never. And then you've got the other camp who are saying, all data should be available so we can have a, a, a better, uh, safer society. I mean, because that, that, that's Singapore and China, basically. I mean, the, yeah, the, so, the problem with the law and order types who, you know, who, who regularly argue that these big tech companies are stopping us from investigating our crime, there is a yeah. society um, where your ideals uh, for data infiltration are being upheld. It's China, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, and there's, there's other regimes as well uh, that, 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 that trample over human rights. That, you know, if you, if you give backdoors into encryption for one country, you give it for every country. You, mm-hmm. you, just, you just can't, you know, this, that's how technology works. And encryption, you can't weaken encryption. Encryption works or it doesn't work. It's mathematics. It's, you know, it, you can't make it different shades and sort of say, well, give a, give a secret backdoor key for law enforcement and only they can use and it'll be fine. It's data is either encrypted and secure and private, or it's not. A lot of this comes back to much more basic elements about power and who do you trust. It's exactly as you were describing yeah. it, as framing it. it. Essentially, a lot of the people who are most in favor of compromising encryption are people who themselves are close to the levers of power or who feel a great sense of trust in uh you know the established uh, administration that's there and there's nothing wrong yeah. with that that's where they are that's where they come from and vice versa the, a lot of people who would be the most mm-hmm. uh, fervently pro encryption and against any compromise on it are people who have the least trust in the administration or who 
they may be rich and privileged themselves, but they just are not closely connected to the levers of power and yeah. they won't be, and they've no ambition to be. Therefore, they, they, there's nothing in it for them uh, uh, yeah. um, to, for, for, for encryption to be in any way compromised. I know that's a, quite a cynical take on it, but I, I do find yeah, that I, to be... I, I, I tend to agree. Like in, I, I put myself in the very pro encryption camp, even though I work closely with law enforcement. I spent four years advising the Europol Cybercrime uh, Center on uh, internet security and cybercrime. And I've had these debates. Uh, I regularly have them with people in law enforcement. To, and, try, and that's why I try to get both sides. But at the moment, mm. we, we do have the debate is too uh, extreme. We do need to be able to have an open discussion to, to maybe get somewhere in the middle and, and, and what we want to say. Because er, encryption is just a piece of technology. Mm. Every technology gets uh, gets abused. You know, cars are used by bank robbers and kidnappers. So it should be bank cars. The, the postal system is used by criminals to say, you know, if you go onto the dark web and buy your drugs in the dark web, well, it, it's shipped to you via mm. the post. You, it, the criminals don't drive up in a, in, a, in a blacked out car and drop off your package at the door. It, it, your postman is probably the person who delivers your drugs to your front door. So do you ban the postal system because mm. it's been abused by, you know, so every part, every technology, and everything we use will be abused by criminals. We just have to see as a society, how do we want to, to police that and manage that and, and, and keep it all secure? Yeah, and, that, uh, and that's an all-pervasive argument as well. I mean, I remember yeah. the days when um, the, the, the corporate entities that were most being uh, targeted, certainly in Ireland, for things like video nasties or yeah. um, harassment or bullying or pornography uh, were actually the telecoms companies. I remember the Virgin, um, mm -hmm. UPC as it was known then, or maybe even Cabling. No, I think it was UPC at the time, <laughs> um, was always being targeted as being a facilitator for piracy and for yes. all sorts of stuff. And they had, they had to constantly fight a rear guard action. Now, now it's moved on completely from them. Now almost nobody blames the actual telecoms networks. And now it's yeah. the the big platforms, it's mostly Facebook, but it's also yeah. Google as well uh, through YouTube. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, the, the arguments change every time, but th there is a, a basic focus on that. And it comes back to human behavior. That's a, that's yeah. a philosophy 101 uh, yeah. <laughs> podcast, which we probably yeah. oh, we need a few beers for it too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so what else? Uh, we don't have that much time to, 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 to go into other stuff I wanted to go. Ransomware is still there? It's still going. Ransomware is right up there with CEO. They're the two biggest things mm. things we see as as, as fraud, um, and uh, you know it's, it's encryption being used by criminals to. to I wonder, to yeah, like I, I, Bitcoin and uh, cryptocurrencies. Yeah. I actually wonder what percentage of the cryptocurrency economy is actually sustained by things like ransomware. I'm not suggesting it's half yeah. or anything like that. It must be an identifiable, identifiable percentage, though. It could be. I honestly don't know the answer. Yeah. Adrian. I don't know. But like ransomware has been around for decades. Mm. The first ransomware we saw was back in the 1990s. But back then, you, you had to wire your, 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 your money to the criminal either by a Western Union or some other wire transfer. So it was much easier for law enforcement to, to trace that transaction and track down who's behind it. Today, as you said, these cryptocurrencies. Now, it's not that it's impossible to track who's behind it. It's just it is more difficult. Uh, and I, I'm coming back to the encryption argument and everything. I, as a society, one of the biggest problems we have is that we've underfunded and under-resourced our police forces in the fight against cybercrime historically. To the state now that they're, to state now that they're so far behind in in capabilities. Um, not not when I say capabilities, not like the individuals involved are very capable, but the, the lack of investment in tools and resources they have, uh, you know, they're they're fighting a, a huge battle uh, with a small group. And one of the things we can do as as individuals and businesses is, is to make sure if you do become a victim of CEO fraud or of ransomware, it's reported to to on Garda Shikar and our, our law enforcement. So they have statistics that they can go to Drew Harris and others to say, look, we need more funding for this. But also that the information that might they might get from your ransomware case or your CEO fraud case 
could be used with other information from other cases, and Europol will put that information together and then could identify who is behind these things. So that 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 that, that is a key thing, you know. If but, if, if if funding for um, the Gardaí in this area was to be dramatically uh, increased, what kind of things would they uh, spend it on? I would I would suggest, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to say I, I, I have access to their budget and I know what the things should be, but I think it, it's it's given them more people. Uh, it's 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 also working with politicians at national and international level to uh, provide better information sharing and legal frameworks for police forces around the world to cooperate. We're still operating on legal frameworks that are dating back to the 20th and 19th century. So, you know, cyber crime, if, if, I, if I was a criminal and I hacked a company uh, somewhere, uh, I'd, I'd, you know, Eastern, Eastern uh, cyber criminals who are hacking banks in you know, our systems in uh, Western Europe or in the US, they're hiding their trail across different servers across the world. So it's it's not a national crime. It's, you know, you the crime happens here in Ireland and Angarda Sheet Connor now has to try and trace it back to two or three di- different jurisdictions to get capture evidence on a machine. Uh, and by the time using traditional uh, ex- information exchange and legal frameworks, it could be 18 months, two years before they get to to the machine and, and what they, what they kind of resources do we have are we talking about like you know a dozen people here working on this or, or? oh well uh, and the guys they've got a computer crime unit i actually don't know how many people are working there uh, at the moment i know the figures have increased uh than they were a, a few years ago but you know we do need to see uh more involvement there our, our actually our, our the garda shikonic cyber crime unit here in ireland is actually well regarded and well respected internationally for the the quality of the work and and and, and, and the work they do and i have to say interactions i've had with them have always been excellent and very professional and they've always been very victim uh focused uh and they're always willing to talk to victims without necessarily having to launch a full investigation just to make sure that people are comfortable with that you know so uh, i remember reading a report uh maybe a year or two ago i this is highly unprofessional i can't actually remember what the context of it was but <laughs> it was to the to the effect that um investigations here sometimes can be a year or two longer mm-hmm. or delayed more than they should be be based to basically on a resourcing issue not a million miles di- different uh, yeah. in terms of analysis from the dpc and how long it takes it to, uh, to sometimes wrap up investigations yeah. but I, I do remember seeing that could you am i right there do you remember that okay i'm going to ask you a question adrian mm. uh, how many computer devices have you got in your house right now how many computer devices yeah does that include things tab- like smart watches and things absolutely yeah usb keys uh, laptops, Whoa. computers. I know you're probably not the typical. I'd be above user, average. I mean, if average. I were to answer your question, though, if I yeah. were to answer your question, um, I'm actually literally looking around me right now. Um, I would probably say 250. Okay, you are above average. Well, let's say the average person, right? An and that's not including USB keys, but go on. No, well, an average household might have, uh, what, maybe 10, 15 devices in a house? That's phones, it, it, a computer phones, or two. Tab- tablets, USB keys, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Now, if one of those people in that house is conducting, is, is, is a, a, a criminal conducting cybercrime and the guardie raid, raid the house, they have to seize every device in that house and they use that as evidence. They have to forensically examine every piece of equipment. And that becomes more and more difficult because just as we started, you're saying you've got a new MacBook Air there. You've probably got a few gigabytes, if not terabytes of data storage on it. On and this one, actually, no, it's 256. Um, I, I do have I've an iPad Pro with a terabyte of data. Yeah, so that takes a lot of time, and that could be encrypted. So, and it is encrypted because by default it is. So the challenge for police forces is they have all this evidence they have to wade through that and and this is where i think that report you came to was actually 
was was uh, for uh, the the Garda unit looking after child abuse uh, uh, cases. That might have been it, yeah. Uh, they forensically have to examine every piece of computer equipment that that the police get with, with, with a suspect, and that can take a huge amount of time to go through. So mm. it's it's tools and it's people and training that that, that we we need to, to to give. But we need to support the police and report crime. One of the things uh, we don't do in the computer community is report crime or admit security breaches. Uh, so th- there is that challenge that. The police aren't seeing getting the crime and how they how they're going to, to, to investigate it and, and, and resource it. Okay, well, look, on that cheery note, Brian, uh, we're, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to leave it off. Thank you very much to Brian Honan, owner of uh, BH Consulting, bhconsulting.com, I believe, as opposed Hello, to BH Consulting. Oh, it is, it's .ie, excuse me, yeah, BH yeah, Consulting. Dot com, dot, dot, dot com has been parked by some fella in the States, so uh, we, we huh. have to get it off. <laughs> okay, maybe a few Bitcoins would, would uh, get it off him. Um, you never know. <laughs> Thank you very also to Fidelity Investments, which is currently the sponsor of this podcast. But from me, Adrian Wackler, the tech editor of the Irish and Sunday Independent, and definitely nothing to do with any celeb bait you will see uh, in the in the near future. Um, I will talk to you next week. Bye bye. Times are uncertain, but your job doesn't have to be. Fidelity Investments is hiring for tech roles in Ireland. Apply now at fidelityinvestments.ie.